This episode has been brought to you in part by the Azrieli Music Prizes. Join them in celebrating artistic excellence at the AMP Gala Concert, live from Maison Symphonique in Montreal, happening October 20th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Orchestre Metropolitain will premiere award-winning music by laureates Aharon Harla, Iman Habibi, and Rita Ueda. Learn more at azrielifoundation.org backslash AMP. David Chantel was a Belgian-Canadian Holocaust survivor who dedicated his life to educating others about the dangers of hatred, intolerance, and racism. By sharing his experience for over 24 years, no matter how difficult it was for him, he has inspired thousands upon thousands of Canadians of all backgrounds to fight genocide and injustice, no matter who the victims well, are. That was what it sounded like on Sunday in Ottawa as the city's mayor and other dignitaries joined the family of the late David Shento, a Holocaust survivor and educator, for a ceremony to rename a local park in his honor. Shento accompanied many March of the Living groups to the death camps of Poland and spoke to countless schools, telling the story of how he was caught by the Nazis in Belgium as a teenager, then sent to do slave labor, including in France and in Warsaw, cleaning up the ruins of the ghetto. He survived Auschwitz, plus a death march, and Dachau before he was liberated at 20 years old, weighing 79 pounds. The park is off Tilbury Avenue in Ottawa's West End. It's just a few minutes' walk north of the Jewish Community Centre, in the city where Shento built a new life after the Second World War, having lost well over a dozen members of his family to the Nazis, including his parents and both his sisters. David Shento died five years ago at the age of 92. His supporters hope that having a park in his name will help continue teaching new generations his message about what hatred can lead to. How much longer will I be here? And that's why I think it's extremely important. I want the world, or the students, to know what it means, hate. Because primarily there's no other word for it. It was hate. I'm Ellen Bessner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Tuesday, September the 13th, 2022. Welcome to the CJN Daily, the podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. The campaign to rename Tilbury Park as David Shento Park was started by his granddaughter's husband and shepherded through the Ottawa City Council by community activist Bram Bregman. The ceremony took place on Sunday as news came of yet another fashion shoot being held at Canada's National Holocaust Monument near Parliament Hill. This one was for bathing suits and also as Ottawa's public school board is embroiled in a dispute with the local Jewish community after educators disinvited Canada's special envoy on Holocaust remembrance, Professor Erwin Kotler, to teach staff about anti-Semitism and instead hired a Jewish professor who opposes the IRA definition of anti-Semitism against the community's wishes. Coming up, we'll bring you a slightly different episode than you're used to as we hear some of the words of the late David Shento and hear him interact with some of the students and teachers who he turned into witnesses, all interspersed with my interview of three people who knew David Shento well and helped make the park naming happen. So they are Lori Shento, David's daughter, Bram Bregman, a March of the Living volunteer in Ottawa, and Ellie Rubenstein, who accompanied Shento on several of these trips to Poland. First of all, can you explain to our listeners how this whole process, this campaign started to get this park renamed? Well, my uh, niece's husband, Chaim Lubimzev, he got the ball rolling. And when he told me about it, I thought it was just a pretty wonderful idea. There's a park not far from where my parents used to live. And so as of Sunday, it's going to be called David Shento Park. So the city of Ottawa has a commemorative naming program where they want community members to submit applications to name parks uh, either in honor uh, or in memory of people that have contributed to society at large in Ottawa. And what happens is the city staff does an initial approval and then it goes out to public consultation. It's actually, that's the point actually where Chaim told me about this program and I got involved at that point because we needed to get letters of support in. And usually you get five or 10 letters of support in. I think we got well over 50. 
I basically just sent a note out to former March the Living participants, families, the community, and just the letters poured in for David, because he was just beloved here in the Ottawa Jewish community. And then at that point, it uh, went to city council, and then it got officially approved by the city council at a council meeting. And uh, as Lori said, now on Sunday, it'll be officially called the David Chento Park, and there'll be a beautiful, like, large sign that says David Chento Park, and there'll be a plaque that uh, briefly describes his life story and his impact. So we want, I want to bring in the March of the Living story because that's how uh, many, many people got to meet him uh, close up when they were traveling together on these trips. How many did he do? And anyone can jump in. Uh, how many marches did he go on? Four or five. Ellie, is that right? Yeah, he went with the coast to coast, or the Ottawa slash coast to coast delegation. And he went a number of times. Well, I'm sure Bram will affirm what I'm saying that he was so beloved by everybody, but especially the teenagers. They connected him so deeply. And David had this charm and this love and this affection and this natural ability to connect everybody, but especially younger people. I was telling Bram earlier, uh, I remember we were on the march, I'm not sure if it was the year Bram was going or not. And I was with David and you know the group, it walked into a hotel and then all of a sudden, like I lost David, I didn't know what happened to him. Like he was next to me a moment later I couldn't find him, right? And you know, it's you're in a different country. You're you're responsible for the Holocaust survivors with you. They can't just disappear. So I, you know, searched around the hotel lobby, and I found that next to the lobby of the hotel there was a group of students from Antwerp, Belgium, where David was from, from the Takamoni school that he went as a child, and there were like a hundred students. I don't know the exact number sitting there in rapt attention, paying, listening to David tell his story, like just like that. Uh, he didn't have a degree in education, but he was a natural born educator, educator and the kids just gravitated towards him. Uh, he, he was really, really an exceptional human being and an exceptional educator, in my opinion. He was a natural storyteller, you know, and I think he just spoke from the heart. He never had any notes and he just told his story in a way that teenagers and young adults could really understand and appreciate. Um, he just spoke clearly. Um, he was very honest with his feelings and raw emotion. And I think it really, you know, spoke to people. Um, you know, after I went on March Living with him, we at the time I was running uh, NCSY and running Jewish culture clubs inside of a lot of public schools. So I would often have him come speak either at a lunchtime at a public school or if I could organize a ceremony, if the school would agree to it, to have like entire grades, like the entire grade nine and tens come and listen to him. And you could hear a pin drop in the room. He just, he just spoke softly and kindly and I'll tell just also one quick story that always I remember is, you know, at the end of his speeches, the kids would come line up. They just wanted to say hi to him, you know, or or just talk to him. Um, and there was one girl I remember that came up and she was just crying hysterically. We only read it in textbooks, right? And we don't get like the full emotion of it. And then you like sitting up there and telling us about this. It just like, it really touched me and it showed like how like strong you are in that like, like she could not control herself. She was just crying. I'm just like, it really moved me. And I'm like always going to remember it. I'm, I know I'm never going to forget it now. And anyone who tells me different, I'm gonna be like, no, this happened. Like, David I've just looked at her and I, said, I felt the pain. Would you like a hug? So, so just thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Give me a hug. Yeah. <laughs> and he just gave her this like hug, thank you, thank you, you know, and it just calmed her down. He, he just had this way about him. I'm going to get a little tearful myself, I'm afraid. Um, you know, I miss my dad very much. And um, not a day goes by that I don't think of him and miss him. And um, it's extremely moving, very touching to know that he is held in such high regard with great affection kind of adds to my love for him. Did he talk about his story when you were growing up? Like, when did he tell you any of his stuff? We always knew. Um, he didn't share great detail until when, as a teenager, I went on a vacation uh, with my parents to, uh, we went to Europe. We were in uh, Brussels and Antwerp. And uh, at the memorial in Brussels, he uh, he brought me close and he said, look, this is my family's names. He reached out and he started uh, 
to point out the names of his father and his mother and his two sisters. And he began to cry. Well, I'd never seen my father cry in my life. And so I started to cry and my mother and my father and I would just held on to each other and let our sadness pour out. What did it mean to him to go on these trips? Because it couldn't have been easy to have to rip that scar open and, you know, reveal all that and live it all over again. Do you, can you tell us what, what you know? Yeah, Ellie will tell you that my father never did anything without my mother by his side. And whether it was talking to a school or going on March of the Living, uh, if they didn't go together, they didn't go. And uh, I think it had to have been a great comfort that my mother was with him during the times that the pain of having to share his testimony was necessary. On a visit to Toronto one afternoon, my parents were... uh, taking a walk and they saw Ernst Zundel in the Cabbage Town part of Toronto. And uh, obviously he had served his time. He was now uh, out of jail because he was uh, convicted of uh, his anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Semitic act. It was shocking that he was able to walk around this, this uh, Holocaust denier. And uh, I think that in many ways is what inspired my father to take on this responsibility of Holocaust education. If I'm not mistaken, he said after seeing Ernst Zundel, I would crawl on my hands and knees to Auschwitz-Birkenau to tell my story to anybody who would listen. He was so upset by what he saw, yeah. If I could just jump in there, um, if that's okay with you, uh, Ellen. Um, I think what we've heard earlier about his ability to tell stories, and I could, I could literally stand for the next half an hour and tell the stories that David Chantal told, not because I'm such a great storyteller, not because any other reason, because he was so impactful when he spoke, you hung on to every single word, you were like right there with him. What is the final solution? The final solution is to uh, get the dispose of all the Jews. The final solution, as a matter of fact, there's a word that they had, the final solution of the Jewish problem. That's how they phrased it. And just to give you an idea, six million Jews, it, it just boggles the mind. Even I was there, and I can't, I can't it's, it's hard to believe. It brought a lot of emotion out in me because I could sort of, I could sort of feel their pain about the way he was telling it. Because he took his time and he said it, and he said it with so much emotion, just like got to me. And when the train finally stopped at four o'clock in the morning, the SS says everything stays on the train. A young lady with a baby close to her breast got off the train, and the baby started to cry. And no matter how hard she was trying to keep the baby quiet. The baby cried harder and harder. The SS walked over to her and says, keep this quiet. Didn't even say keep the baby quiet. Keep it quiet. How can you keep a baby quiet? The SS ran towards her and grabbed the baby by the legs and threw it against the train. The heartbreaking crying from the mother, I can't find the word to describe it. Where am I? What is going on? This is just the first 15, 20 minutes. The horrors of it, like how actually horrible it was and how people could be so cruel and do all those things to other human beings. That's what really stands out to me. So these are these moments that when David told his story, you were right there with him. And my hope is when young people go to the park and see this park named after David Chantel, they'll go back into their computers, go onto Google and look him up and get a chance to listen and hear the incredible memory and history and stories that he has to tell because they're, they're really important for the David future of humanity to right listen to a voice like David Chantel. And he stood there and went through the whole entire thing with all of us watching. Um, he relived it and To this day, I think that that was the most influential thing that I have ever witnessed in my lifetime. Um, 
and it was it was the point in which that's what I decided that I wanted to be a teacher. And I mean, March of the Living, of course, with the pandemic, right? Couldn't go, didn't go this year either uh, from Canada. How are you going to, if at all, incorporate some of his teachings or his legacy going forward? We hope that every March of the Living that, you know, David Chantel's story is told. And we have basically, uh, March of the Living has a digital archives project where we have all many of these testimonies in the archives. And as in fact, um, you m- might remember a couple of years ago, we made a movie called Blind Love, A Holocaust Journey of Poland Man's Best Friend. And in that film, we have David Chantal's testimony, which I've personally filmed, because he arrives in Auschwitz-Birkenau, and he's standing next to a person. And he asked, can I go and take some pictures? I'll leave the luggage on the train, but can I take some pictures? Everything stays on the train, you don't take anything with you. When he says, please, it's important for me to take a picture along. The SS, it was the SS who was... The Nazi loses his temper and six the dog they on the man standing next to him and kills him on the spot. Loose. And a German shepherd jumped on that man straight on his neck. And this was just just the front of me. My God, where am I? Then David said... Then I knew I'm in hell. I realized I'd arrived in hell. We intend to ensure, either through film or through text, to make sure that every step of the way that we will hear David's voice and the young people from coast to coast will be educated as the previous generations were, even though he's not there in person. And, and I hope you don't mind also that I'd like to share some of David's own words. I'm just going to read an excerpt. I was, I'm very honored that the family asked me to share a few words at the naming ceremony on Sunday. And these are the words that he said. He said, and Ellie alluded to this first sentence before, I said there and then I would crawl on my hands and knees all the way to Auschwitz-Birkenau or anywhere else to tell my story to anyone who was willing to listen. This is why I march and why I still speak. It's something that I have to do, so I'm doing it. I knew I had a big job ahead of me and I'll do it as long as I have the energy because once I'm gone, the second generations, all they can say is my parents told me or my grandparents told me. That's another reason why I talk to schools because when I talk about it, I always feel I'm not the only witness anymore. All these people who who hear me they are witnesses now. Special thanks to the Zelikovitz Center for Jewish Studies at Carleton University for the audio clips of David and the students. If you want to watch that actual documentary that it came from, the link is in our show notes. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily Podcast of the Canadian Jewish News, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Today's listener shout-out goes to Glenn Nashen and his family in Montreal, a loyal listener whose father George has just passed away on the weekend in his 100th year. George Nashen was a Canadian war veteran, a menswear manufacturer, a community volunteer, and during the pandemic, the Quebec National Assembly awarded George a medal for all his community efforts and had former General Senator Romeo Dallaire presented to him. And we'll end the show with a reminder that for this week only, you can join the CJN with a Rosh Hashanah discount. Until September 14th, you get $36 off the regular price, but you get guaranteed delivery of our beautiful new magazine, which is coming out next week. Just go to the link in our show notes and use the promo code 5783 when you pay. Thanks for listening. 